what I want to do is to um, uh, talk about oil. All right. And but before I say that, I don't know why it always happens that I end up at the end of programs. And my <laughs> fundamental nice. rule is uh, never get in the way of student interest in food. <laughs> so, well, anyway, um, uh, what what I'd like to do is to um, uh, uh, to uh, well, also comment on a few of the generalizations made in the past. Uh, um, I think it was uh, excellent preparation for my uh, presentation because what I'm going to be doing is dealing essentially with the global affairs um, and um, what happening, especially in the global energy arena, and how that has an effect. Uh, upon the conditions that are, are going to be uh, felt or are being felt now in, uh, uh, in the area that we've just studied, uh, Georgia, South Caucasus, and um, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, and um, the Caspian Sea region in general. So, um, so uh, before I, I, I go into this in some detail, because it's going to get somewhat boring at times uh, with all these pipelines and so on and so forth, uh, I have to tell you something about my background. Uh, and usually when I'm introduced, uh, the, the, well, the most famous introduction of me was uh, by a drill, drilling foreman in Saudi Arabia um, at, a, at a meeting where I was supposed to convince all of the people in the Arabian American Oil Company not to leave uh, Saudi Arabia because of the 1978 uh, revolution going on in Iran and then the, the expansion of revolutionary activities into Saudi Arabia. So what he did is he took my CV and held it up in the air and looked at it like this, and his, his hand just looked like the end of a drill bit, so big, from Texas. And he said, this here is Andy Hayes. He's had a checkered career. <laughs> what did he do after that? <laughs> so, so yeah, I've been, uh, been in a, uh, a different uh, positions. So I, I grew up in South America, actually, and my father was sent down to uh, Peru during uh, World War II to get the rubber out of Brazilian Peruvian jungles, and um, I was put in a in a school where there were no no classes in English. Everything was in Spanish. So that that had a fundamental effect on me, I think, uh, and one of the reasons why I'm here at the Fletcher School and why I'm talking to this audience, all of whom have multiple linguistic uh, capabilities. Um, so um, after that, it was. Uh, um, um, a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, uh, six years in the Marine Corps, uh, work in a steel mill, not having an academic at all, you know? and then off into the academic world and um, an interest in the Middle East and a uh, um, career as an Ottoman historian for a while after having to flee um, Egypt during the 67 revolution. And I did that for 11 years. Um, and my field of study was uh, Ottoman history, um, both the Eastern and Western versions of that. Uh, and uh, then after the Ottoman history experience, I got fed up with the academic world and I worked, went to work for the Arabian American Oil Company. I was the manager of um, the uh, uh, gas program uh, you know, when it was uh, established in, uh, um, in Saudi Arabia from 1978 up into 83 when I left and I came to Fletcher School and they hired me to teach Southwest Asia. I had no idea where Southwest Asia was at all because I've been exposed to the Middle East. So anyway, I found out where Southwest Asia was, which is essentially Pakistan all the way over to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and then I found out there's something called globalization, which means that you don't pay that much attention to the boundaries these days because of the forces unleashed by all these technologies uh, that are around. So, so what I'm going to do is to, uh, to say something about the geopolitics of uh, the region that um, we're covering today um, and, uh, and then uh, make a special setting for the uh, application of, um, of modern technology in terms of, uh, of producing energy for um, a world that wants to gobble it up at very fast rates. And uh, I think that what I can say is that the South Caucasus in this uh, area, which has a Bajan, is, uh, in, um, is caught on a uh, frontier between the world powers that support Europe and the United States, um, uh, the interests of, of, of Russia, and how the new Asian powers of India and China are beginning to, uh, to make a drive.
drive to control or acquire as much oil as possible. And all of this affects um, the issues that, were, that each one of uh, the speakers before me um, uh, raised. Um, so uh, let's first of all uh, say something about the, the, the period that we're in, technologically speaking. Um, now, for students here at the Fletcher School, what I, I tell them is that you're living in an era of accelerated technological change. That is, things are happening, technically speaking, that are not in a straight line. And if you think of them in a straight line, you're going to miss the black swans. That is, the events that occur because they're so complex that they just get out of control, like the weather systems. Okay. So, so uh, there's technological change going on at a very rapid rate. And what this does is it, pre it, it, it presents a those people that are in the business of providing uh, services for society, for industry, for uh, just staying alive, uh, it provides them with a great uh, interest in finding energy. Uh, I think that you can see that the proof of this is what's happening uh, with the energy market in terms of uh, the way in which uh, China and India and Europe and the United States are increasingly searching for different uh, sources of, uh, of oil and gas and energy and ways of preventing the consequences of over rapid use of fossil fuels, which is one of the big subjects of the Fletcher School. Okay, so, uh, so we have accelerated rates of technological changing going on and a big political drive to control uh, the sources of oil and gas, or to fight over them in many cases, as we'll see. Um, and then we have something um, uh, else happening, and that is that, uh, that individual industries are going through periods of uh, accelerated technological change also. See? So in the case of, of, of Azerbaijan and uh, the gas and oil producing states in the Caspian Sea region, what this means is they have to contend with something involving the way in which it's, uh, all of these oil companies and their supporters are going about finding the oil and producing it. And, and if you look at that issue, you come up with something called the shale revolution, don't you? Yes. Didn't it turn around the, the, the energy economy of the United States almost in a, a couple of years? Well, it's been going on for quite some time, but the impact of what the advances were in that field, technical advances, were, were felt in the last two or three years such that the United States is no longer dependent upon uh, foreign powers for great quantities of, of oil and gas become independent. Uh, what do you think the impact is on Russia of that? Russia supplies a huge amount of oil and gas to, the, to, uh, to, to Europe, doesn't it? And to, and to many of the states on its periphery, or many of the states that were probably part of the old Soviet Union. So look at the, the gas grid. This, these are the gas and oil pipelines that link together the Soviet Union. They're all over the place. And the smaller ones, uh, the little lines over there are for local consumption of oil and gas where the state charges society what? About 40% of the, of the foreign income of, uh, of Russia comes from the sale of, uh, of gas to Europe. Huge amount of money. It makes Russia into a kind of a rentier state, a uh, state dependent um, only on a, so, a single big uh, exportable product. So uh, what happens in the, in the local areas is that the state used the gas and oil that was supplied in a very cold area of the world uh, to local populations as a means of maintaining control over the local population by keeping the prices low. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, what's just happened to the Ukraine? Price high. Very high. Yeah. So, so this is part of the, of, of the story. Uh, there's technological changes uh, are going on right now uh, that are bringing the demand for oil and gas up very substantially. And uh, the, uh, the area that previously used to be in the Soviet Union is one of the great supply places, right? If you look at any map uh, that has gas and oil reservoirs, then you see big blotches in the center of Russia, right? uh, around the Ural area, mountain area. Uh, uh, some far over uh, north of China, uh, but most in the Ural area, and then all these pipelines running out everywhere. And, you know, what, <clears throat> now, when Russia came apart in 1991 and formed uh, these different states that had 
uh, different ethnic groups. Right? Uh, a lot of the reservoirs and the gas pipelines and so on passed through or were in some of these, these states that came into being. And so uh, they, of course, uh, had to sit down and say, what do we do? You know, we used to be part of the, the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union took our oil and gas and sold it for the state uh, income and kept the whole system running, uh, right? <clears throat> and now we're uh, supposedly an independent republic or an independent state. Uh, what do we do with the gases and, uh, and oils in our territory? And how do we look at the, at the pipeline situation so that we profit from it and not the, what's left over of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the Soviet Union? All the pipelines, of course, were structured so, as you can see in the, in the, in the map here, so that everything flowed out of, out, of, out of the center of Russia over to the various areas of the world. And before the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you already had got, uh, uh, pipelines <coughs> going out into, into Asia towards China. Um, and then, uh, of course, later on, they'll get to India in one form or another. Uh, so let me, let me then um, go on to talk a little bit about Russia, if I can press the right button here and, and move forward. Uh, this, this shows that, uh, that Russia has, um, uh, this is a map of what's supposed to happen in the future. And actually, it's a little bit out of date because the, the pipeline all, um, that runs straight from Kazakhstan into China is already in operation, and there's a second line that's running from Uzbekistan into, in, into China. And then China is proceeding to try to develop some of its internal resources, which are not uh, shown on the map here. It has, it has shale, gas, and oil. So, uh, <clears throat> so you can see that, uh, that uh, the, the Russian government, uh, the Soviet Union first, and then the Russian government is well aware of the potential markets for its uh, energy products in, in, in Asia. And it, it will try to serve those, those markets, so long as uh, the security situation um, that's involved in pumping oil and gas into, into China um, and, and off in the, in the West are, are those that favor uh, Russian control over, the, over this particular border. Um, those of you that know something about the history of, of uh, relationship between Russia and China know that that border is a contentious one. And, and even now, there are, there are difficulties between Russia and China on, on, on this issue, and then there's Japan. So, but this is out of the ball game for us. We want to talk about what's going on in, um, closer to the, the, the home for, for us today. And <clears throat> let me see. Uh, yeah, this is um, uh, the Caspian Sea region over here. Um, at the Fletcher School, for the, the business of studying the geopolitics of energy um, in the area most interesting for Europe and the United States. We focus on three areas in this region. One is the Caspian Sea region, which has a lot of oil and gas, and especially gas. Turkmenistan is a huge supply of gas. I can go into the figures on all of this, but I think that if we happen, if, if I do that, I will get a bigger rush for food and away from what's going on here. So. Let's just say Turkmenistan has got it in the ground. All, all it has to do is get it out. So, and that's the key issue for this area over here. Uh, how do you get the oil and the gas from that region out? And, uh, and, <clears throat> and if, uh, if you're sitting in, in, in Moscow, or better, uh, if you're head of Gazprom, what you want to have happen is that, that, that none of the oil and gas from the center of this region goes out without their control over it. No, so, so Turkmenistan is over here, and if it wanted to, if it had the ability to, if the politics are right, he could take its, its gas and put it into a pipeline underneath the sea to Baku, and then it would go up to Europe. Would the Russians be happy with that? They wouldn't, because probably that pipeline would not go through any Russian territory. So, so, and then the rest of these states down here are not part of the uh, Russian complex. Um, so they purchase the oil and gas. The money goes to them and not to not to Russia. Now remember, Russia is a is a state that has a 40% uh, income from the outside in um, on the basis of oil and gas. And so, if it starts to lose a big percentage of that, then the ability of the state to function effectively goes down. So if the United States wants to make sure 
that Russia does what it wants to do, it would be interested somehow, I would think, in making sure that some of the states in this region that have oil and gas are able to get it out without going through Russian territory. Right? And that's exactly what happened uh, with Azerbaijan. And, uh, and President Aliyev was really on the ball in realizing what to do when the Soviet Union collapsed and when he faced the, the business of trying to create a modern state in this area of the world. And that what, that what happened next was then the signature of policies bringing to being a pipeline that ran from da Baku over into the Mediterranean and not through Russian territory. And I guarantee you the rest of the states in this region, including Kazakhstan that's very friendly with, with Russia, supposedly this state, would very much like to have an opportunity to get out of the center of this area with its oil and gas. And uh, correspondingly, uh, it's probably going to be, it's going to probably take every effort to, uh, that they have in their back pocket to do this uh, uh, against the interests of, uh, of, of Russia. So this is sort of the general outline of what we're going to follow in terms of the, you know, the way we're going to move things closer to, um, uh, to um, uh, well, these are proposed pipelines to, to um, other areas of the Middle East that are probably going to come into being um, after a while if there's any kind of settlement of the Afghan war um, uh, Iranian situation that will bring oil and gas out of the Central Asia. And this is another map of, of developments that are taking place in the, the Eastern Mediterranean area where um, Israel now has a, has a booming business in the, uh, in, uh, the exploration of offshore gas fields. And, they're moving the, the gas into um, uh, arrangement would probably take it to Turkey, either offshore or on, on land. Um, these, are, these are the places in the world where there are shale gas formations. The reason that I'm showing you this is because there's a revolution going on in the gas industry, um, which, is, um, which enables gas companies to produce uh, gases from, from uh, fossil fuel areas that previously had not been able to be achieved. And they're doing it on a massive scale, which we found going on in the United States, and it's going to happen elsewhere. What's that going to do to the, to the oil and gas business? What are the implications for Russia? Do you know what they are? Well, if you did, you'd probably be in a different job than that of a student. <laughs> so, so, so this is part of the revolution that's going on during the period. Um, these are pirate attacks, and, and then this is a, the South China Sea, uh, which is going to become a contentious space, already is, really, uh, because most of the oil moving from uh, some of the, the states from the north in, inside Russia, uh, or moving from the Gulf, uh, go through the, this uh, South China Sea uh, channel, um, and then up to China. <coughs> okay, now, um, we got to a map that is really supposed to be at the forefront of my discussion. And uh, as always, I screw up and give you too much in the way of pipeline things. But what we need to do is to look at this uh, because it is uh, uh, the pipeline network that, uh, that covers the area that's important for us, which is um, the, the area that uh, over here that um, includes Armenia and the, and the Georgian uh, region over there. Okay, now this is Baku right here, and this is the Baku pipeline that goes to the Jehan, the pipe over there. This doesn't pass through any territories that are controlled by Russia. Russia may have some say indirectly with Turkey because Turkey does a lot of business, construction business with, uh, uh, with Russia. But in terms of oil and gas activities, uh, this is a pipeline that produces oil from offshore area over here in uh, um, uh, along the coast of Baku. For those of you who are historians and know something about the development of the energy interest, uh, industry, know that back in the 19th century, uh, the first major development of oil from this region of the world on a global scale was done at Baku. In the late 19th century, the, the most oil going out into the global community came from this region. Then it fell off as uh, exploration of other areas uh, developed. Okay, now, in the in the modern period, what's happened here is that there are oil fields in, in uh, Kazakhstan to the north. The pipeline system constructed by the Russian 
carries most of that oil up into, um, into Russia. The relationship between Kazakhstan and Russia is, or what? Is it good? Is it uh, Ukrainian-like? Uh, I think the, uh, yeah, he has to be careful. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, so what's happening, what's happening uh, up here is that uh, the oil produced by Kazakhstan uh, is sent in, in part to Russia, keep, keeping the old uh, business going, and then they take a little bit and then a little bit more and they put it in tankers and they ship it down and pump it out and pump it out through the Baku Jihan pipeline. What's the future? Then the other thing that is interesting about uh, uh, this um, involvement, and we know that there more tankers are coming into being. In fact, they're already under purchase at this stage of the game. So there is definitely a move on the part of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Kazakhstan to, to, to uh, send a lot of its, uh, its energy or its oil or gas out, out through the uh, Baku Jan pipeline. But the, the next thing that we want to talk about is gas. Um, what can you do with gas? Can you put it on a tanker? Yeah, you can. You liquefy it, right? But it's an expensive business, right? And then you have to deliver it to some place that has a system that can regasify it and send it through into various plants and homes and so on. Right? So you have to have special arrangements at the at the uh, energy of production, um, yeah, and another special arrangement where it's to be consumed. So a little bit more expensive. But what do you know about about technical systems after they're invented? So the first of the liquefied natural gas systems that were really important in the world were de uh, developed in the, in the Gulf area with, by Qatar. Right? Okay. So, so, <clears throat> so what the, 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 the problem is for the gas produ being produced in the north, and there are various fields there that are quite productive, uh, the Tengiz and Kashagan fields and so on. Uh, uh, what they're thinking about is uh, running a pipeline down either across in this direction over here, or along the shore, and then over in this direction to Baku. And then you'll have in Baku an oil pipeline, and then next to it a gas line called looping. And the gas line uh, is, um, as it uh, appears here in the map, uh, takes it up into Turkey, and then uh, later, later on it'll go up into the Balkans. And if you, if you look at the uh, U.S. State Department energy uh, platform or, or home page over there, you'll find that Mr. Pasquale, who's the president's assistant, who's been in, put in charge of, the, of developing energy activities that are uh, profitable for American companies and for American friends, uh, that they are really in favor of this. They want the pipeline, the gas pipeline, to go not under into Russia, but through Turkey, north across into Greece, maybe over to Italy, and then up through the Balkans into Romania and, and Bulgaria. And this is called, in various terms, the South Stream system. And correspondingly, the Russians reacted. And the Russians have the South Stream system, which is a pipeline that is supposed to cross the, the uh, um, let's see, the Black Sea uh, from the Russian territories, which you can, you can see it up there in, um, uh, in, in the north, uh, and it and goes into uh, into the Ukraine or into Bulgaria, and then goes up into Europe. Right? And that project is actually under construction, and it's huge. It's a sixty billion dollar arrangement. Right? So so the, <clears throat> so Turkmenistan is a, a state that interests us uh, because it's uh, it's about what six hundred miles between. Turkmenistan and, and Baku, the coastline there? 200 miles. 200 miles. Well, you're, t you're talking about the, the distance on the water. Yeah. But be between the fields, no. there is need for to build um, 60 kilometers interconnected. That's it. Okay, all right. So, what's the problem? Turkmenistan has huge supplies of gas, huge, and they're located in the in the eastern portion of the of the country, but that's not a problem in, in getting it moved. Um, what the, what uh, happened is that um, the, uh, uh, the the way of getting the, the gas out of Turkmenistan uh, field 
uh, is concerned was that uh, there would be a pipeline that would go underneath the Caspian Sea and then come up at Baku and then go through the gas line that leads into Turkey and up. Uh, these are all problems that are on our book. There are people that have engineered them. They're, they're, there's some investment and, and some activities, uh, but there's a, a difficulty with crossing through the Caspian Sea. Uh, and I notice some of you are nodding your heads. They've been exposed to the, the legal arrangements. Uh, see, this is, is this, is the Caspian Sea? Is it a lake or is it a sea? If it's a lake, there's one set of, of, of legal international legal uh, regulations. If, if it's a sea, there's another one. Um, and so what um, the, the, the Azeris and the Turkmen, Turkmenistan, people in Turkmenistan, they don't give a damn about this. They just want to put the gas through. See? And so, uh, so Russia responds, and along with Russia, so does Iran. But you can't do that because you're in, you're, we haven't settled the whole international legal business about the status of the Caspian Sea. And then, uh, when everybody started grumbling about that and wanted to have the things happen so that everybody would develop well in this region of the world, what happened next was, you can't do it, said the Russians, because it would violate uh, the laws, the international laws against pollutions of lakes. <laughs> so, so uh, where are we uh, about international legal issues? There was a comparative... Uh, argument made here too about the, a little while ago about the difference between the Crimea and, uh, and this region and this region of the world I think uh, and I think we find that the Russians are serving their national interests um, uh, there as they think they're serving their national interests in terms of the of uh, what's happening in Crimea now I would like to say parenthetically uh, that what you do during this stage of the game when you're in a, in an age of, of of technological revolution and innovation and um, and technical developments of large scale and all of that, um, what you do is you don't go off and conquer lands. That's old imperial activity. Um, and, and what would the conquering Crimea do, as somebody said here before, except add more to the burden of keeping the water and electricity and the rest of the stuff going on the land? Uh, why the reason for Russia being interested in the Crimea is there from the geopolitics of the region, which is it enables people that are controlling the center of Eurasia to get involved in ocean trade. And the Russians won't give that up, I guarantee you. <laughs> All right, so, so uh, let's see what we got in the way of other uh, maps on this area too. Now uh, this is the, a faded map of, the, uh, of approximately the same thing uh, showing um, how the Russians are moving in the direction of a, of a pipeline system and of activities of connecting with, with Europe through territories that they control and uh, the other people that are competing with them, the new states that have come into being after the collapse of the Soviet Union and, their, uh, and American and European allies are uh, indeed supporting for uh, the other side of things, uh, other areas. Uh, and this is a, a, a short view of the of uh, the, in, the internal pipeline uh, connections in uh, uh, in Turkmenistan that are already underway to provide gas on the, on the Caspian Sea frontier, and, and then uh, this is how the connection is going to be made with with Azerbaijan. It's a big event, and you, you don't hear very much about it in the in, in the newspapers because everybody concentrates on the local or regional. And when we live in an era that's global, right? Yeah. And if the global economy starts to flop, um, yeah, everyone's going to go down. So if the United States is independent of, of foreign oil and gas, it's not independent of the implications of a declining global economy. Uh, so it has an interest in these things happening uh, in, in a way that doesn't involve war. Right? So, all right. Uh, all these that's the end of the maps. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, just is in, in way of concluding, is uh, uh, to uh, uh, say that, uh, uh, that in the framework of, um, of the geopolitics of the of the Caspian Sea region of the of this area of uh, the Middle East or of Eurasia, wh whatever way you want to look at it globally, um, is that it's a it's a frontier region. It's a region where states stop or that for one one. Um, one reason or another, um, and 
in the case of the past, those of you who read classical history know that, uh, that the Greeks would, could never really get over there and conquer the Persians. And the Persians couldn't really move that much to the north either. And, and then if you look at the history of Russia, they come south and they stop in this region. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area that when, when the great empires are moving around and, and uh, fighting each other, uh, has some sort of peace and the internal development is, is segmented because of the geography of the region. Um, and then in periods when there's when there's a great deal of activity, uh, then we find that sides start to be taken in the struggle for who controls whatever it is to be controlled in this region. And this time, it's, it has a lot to do with energy resources. Uh, and so that's what all of us have to play in trying to understand the politics of the region. Um, and so, so I, I will conclude with, um, was, where's Brian? Did he, he left? Oh, he had to leave, yeah. Right. Well, it was interesting. Um, I went to um, um, I went to uh, 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 Iraq in 2007 uh, to um, to establish some training programs for the Kurds in Erbil, and um, we we started to do that, and we were invited then down to uh, Baghdad to stay in the Rashid Hotel uh, because they wanted the same thing, and and so uh, we went down to the Rashid Hotel, and we noticed that the front of the Rashid Hotel is full of bullet holes. And up to about the fifth floor, you have three quarter inch plywood over, over the windows. And the first thing they tell you when you check in is keep those black curtains closed. And so you know what's going on. Well then, the, the, the uh, second day that we were there, we, were had, we had an appointment with the, the Deputy Minister of Education. So we, um, I had a student with me. I should have thought better about doing this. But anyway, I had a student with me. We walked down to the front of the hotel and walked out into the front gate and all of a sudden ba 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 oh, I have heard that before. This is a 30 caliber machine gun or the Russian equivalent of it. Uh, uh, breaking the front portion of the of the garden of the Rashid Hotel. Um, so we rushed back in then about uh, three minutes later there's a black helicopter with no markings on that flies over and sprays the area in front of the hotel and everything quiets down. Yeah. Then we run downstairs to see what's going on, and all of a sudden there are a huge number of soldiers in, in, in uh, uh, camouflage gear with their rifles and everything coming out of the hotel from the, the floors. I think they were on the 14th floor and up. And, uh, and they were speaking Spanish. <laughs> so, so I broke out my Spanish, and I said, who, who are you and where are you from? And they said, we're from Peru. That's where I grew up. And, I said, well, what are you doing here? Uh, and, and they said, the pay is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will conclude.